Welcome to Shoreline Conversations. I'm Thomas, the producer of this podcast, and we're going to call this episode one of season two. We've taken a little bit of a break. Uh, the The world booted back up and things got a, a little busier around here, but we really want to keep this podcast going. Uh, we want to keep this pretty regular and uh, I don't know if it'll be as frequent as it was during the, the shutdown days, but we really want to keep these going and what better way to launch back into it than with Greg Kelly, the CEO of World Mission. And last you heard us, we were in the middle of our Pillars series, and this fits really well right into that as missions, the Great Commission is is has been a pillar of the Christian faith. So uh, let's get right into it. Keith is back with us hosting, having a conversation with Greg Kelly. Well, I'm here today with Greg Kelly, CEO of World Mission, and we're just going to get to know him a little bit today. So let's start with that, Greg. Tell yeah. us a little bit about you and World Mission. Yeah, thanks, Keith. Great to be here uh, with you guys. Love Shoreline. Um, been at World Mission for 23 years. That is a long so, yeah, time. Yeah, it's a long time. I, I tell people... Just so you know, I'm 24 years old, so that's a really long time. <laughs> that's that your whole life, right? So uh, not too uh, exciting of a start. World Mission started in 1994, and I became a volunteer in 1995. So I was asked by somebody, they walked in and I was an insurance, I had my own agency with Farmers Insurance at the time and minding my own business, you know, not looking for anything extra, involved in my local church, all that kind of stuff. And this guy walks into my office and he says, hey, there's a startup nonprofit and they're doing a golf outing and I'm going to help them with it. And I, and I thought of you to help me as well. And he, and he brought it to me, a beautiful brochure. And I looked at it and I looked at him and I just literally started laughing at him. <laughs> like, I don't have time for this. I'm already doing, you know, uh, my ministry for the Lord. So I took it and I put it in the trash. Hmm. As my, that was my beginning with World Mission. And Keith, I sat at my desk and for the first time, um, really just felt that conviction of the Holy Spirit. And felt God saying, you know, investigate this. I need you to look at this. And I was literally having an argument with the Lord. So much so yeah. that uh, I yell out, okay, in an audible voice. <laughs> and the people in the office, I think they knew no one was in my office with me. And they thought, you know, who is he talking to? <laughs> and I got up uh, out of my seat and I walked to the trash can and I pulled up this brochure wow. on World Mission. So that was the that was the beginning of it for me. And that was uh, 26 years ago. And then three years later, uh, we felt, uh, Kath and I, the Lord calling us into full-time ministry and had no idea who, what, when, where, why, how, um, just knew he was calling us. And interestingly, a year before I told Kath, my dream job would be working at World Mission. I, I know it would never happen, but that's my dream. And uh, lo and behold, a year later, they called and they they said, uh, uh, we'd like you to become our director. And that was 23 years ago that I uh, sold my business Wow! and have been with them ever since. So you went from being a volunteer to being director exactly three wow. years and that's that's how they they had actually one of my good friends was uh helping them with uh, their their finances and the, kind of the accounting side of it and the uh chairman of the board who founded the organization said hey we need a director their former director the only one before me right. became a full-time missionary in bosnia so they had a, a few months where they didn't have anyone and he said do you know anybody and uh, he goes, well, actually, I know a guy who's been helping us on the golf outing. He's uh, praying about ministry. And they called me up. I went to a board meeting without a resume or anything, just because of my relationship mm -hmm. on the golf outing. And they said, uh, what are you doing? And I, you know, I, I didn't realize they were asking me, like, what are you doing with the rest of your life? I thought it was like, what are you doing for lunch or something? And they, uh, they said, we'd like you to become director. So we knew that was the Lord. It's so fun to hear you talk about it. You're, you're passionate, you know, all these years later, yeah, you know, yeah. 26 years after you started. That's really a cool thing. I, I uh, have had a number of things that have happened because uh, when we first started at World Mission, we were, I tell people we were doing kind of shotgun missions. So the, the guys who started World Mission, they literally started it, business guys, you know, just super successful individuals. And uh, basically, if it hit the wall and stuck, it was like, yes. And so we're doing child sponsorships and water projects, short-term teams. We're building wheelchair accessible ramps in our local community, everything. And um, I was just getting burnt out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, burnt out, you know, it's like, what do you do? I, my, my biggest fear was someone cornering me and telling, you know, asking me what you just did. 
you know, what do you do at World Mission? I would, ah, because that would be all these things. And I, I read a book, Keith, called Unveiled at Last. Mm. And that changed my life and, and really sent me on a trajectory of this idea of reaching people who don't have access to the gospel. And now for 23 years, that's what we've been doing. And how do you do that? How does World Mission reach those people who yeah, don't it's, have it's access? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, and when I tell people, you know, when we're talking about over 7 billion people in the world, and I tell people a third of the world fall into that category. People are like, what? I mean, how is that possible, right? right? I mean, we are, we're the first generation in history that if you took a globe and spun it and just put your finger down anywhere in the world, you and I could be there in 24 hours, right? right? I mean, we are the first generation. Um, and so it's not, it's not been an issue of lack of sort of um, ability to get there. Mm. Um, it's, we just lack the determination, I think, because... Uh, the issue is not for lack of resources. And you may never hear this from another mission organization, but <laughs> because it's always like, okay, here's the missionary and now they're going to ask for Give money, right? Money. Exactly. Yeah. Um, there's been studies that have done been done, Keith, that say in the body of Christ together, if you take Shoreline, every other church that's putting resources in, there's 17 times the necessary resources being invested into missions right. to get the job done. The problem is not more money. The issue is how we're allocating that. And we are disproportionately allocating our resources. And not, I'm not just talking about money. I'm talking about prayers, the Bibles going out, the translation project, uh, water projects, whatever it is, disproportionately are going to places where the gospel's already been. Mm -hmm. And so when I read in that book that we are spending more money on Halloween costumes for our pets than this one third of the world without access to the gospel. I just thought I, not acceptable. Mm -hmm. And from that time until now, there's a fire inside of me, Keith, that I just am driven um, by this issue of getting it. And um, there's a lot of ways that we go about it that I'm sure we can get into, but Absolutely. that's really the, 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 Sort of the genesis of it for me was that moment right. where I was reading that book and learning about this, thinking, I had no idea. Here mm -hmm. I had been a, a leader of World Mission for three years at that point, and I read this book, and I learned about, what? There's all these people without access? That, mm -hmm. How is that possible? And, and you just can't. Once you come in contact with certain information and truths, mm -hmm. and the Holy Spirit says, yeah, and I want you to be a part of that, I mean, you just, you just can't get away from that. I've gone on a few missions trips, uh, Central and South America, uh, cent Central America, yeah. North and Central America, I guess, right? Yeah. Mexico, yeah. Guatemala, El Salvador. And when I'm in these places and I'm telling these mostly kids about Jesus, mm -hmm. like well, they're like, yeah, I know Jesus. Like I hear about him every single yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and I did an altar call one time at a, a camp in uh, El Salvador, in San Salvador. And they said, hey, would you do an altar call, gospel yeah. presentation, an altar call. And I just didn't feel right about it. Yeah. I did it. I honored them, yeah. you know, and no one responded. Yeah. And I don't believe it had anything to do with me. It was like, no. nope, because they all had, they all they had heard Lord. it so they many times. You yeah. know? They, they, they knew it. it they was, knew it. I wasn't coming and in. There's a lot of places in our hemisphere. You know, we, we are so blessed. I mean, obviously, America, the American Bible Society says that you and I, and on average, and anyone listening to this podcast today, you have eight Bibles in your home. Right on average. And so you think about the abundance of access. Mm. I don't look at that as like, oh, that's shame. No, I looked at it as a God's blessing on America and mm. our access right. to it. But um, you go into other places and there's equal access. Now it looks very different than America, right? Because you can go into that, you know, some of those countries you're talking about in Latin America and South America and Haiti is another great example. So I spent, the, I cut my teeth on missions in Haiti. I probably did 10 trips there oh, with wow. short-term trips and everything in our Western, our own hemisphere. I mean, I could be there from Michigan in five hours. Right. I could be in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And um, the thing about Haiti is that it's one of two countries in the world where 100% of the population, when asked the question, do you know a Christian? The answer is yes. Wow. So is there poverty? Yes. Is there witchcraft? Yes. Is it messed up? And is there, you know, all kinds of corruption? I mean, the president just got killed for goodness yeah. sake. I mean, so it's messed up. But lack of access to the gospel is not right. an issue, Haiti. Getting more disciples in depth of their discipleship is sure. certainly an issue. Uh, and that doesn't mean that we're to ignore 
Haiti. Uh, that's that that is not at all the the issue. But yeah. it really comes back to we here at Shoreline spoke over the weekend about Acts chapter one verse eight, Jesus' yeah. last words. So Keith, yeah. I love this because it truly is Jesus' last words. Um, because in Acts one nine. It says, and then the presence of the disciples, a cloud, and up Jesus yeah, went. Right? Go. So it's his yeah, last words. Later, right. And this is what he said. He said, when you receive the Holy Spirit and power, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, ends of the earth. We're all familiar with those locations. The thing I'm drawn to is the conjunction. Hmm. So that conjunction is not a comma, and right. it's not an or. No, it's and. Right? It's and. All right. And so many times we look at missions as sequentially. In other right. words, you know, here we are in Monterey, your guys, Jerusalem. For me, it's Grand Rapids, right. Michigan. And we look there and we see messed up stuff. We see homeless people. We see people who don't know the Lord. True, 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 true. And then we get this notion. And a lot of times I'll, I'll have a discussion with someone. I'll tell them what I do. And they'll pat me on the back and they'll say, yeah, that's great. You're going to Africa, Greg. <laughs> but there's enough need in Chicago in my fill in the blank sure. and that's where God's called me so you go do your thing in Africa now I appreciate the sentiment of that and I get where they're coming from very sincere but the Bible doesn't back that up right because God didn't call us to be sequential Christians mm -hmm. he called us to be simultaneous Christians mm -hmm. because the words and so what that means is I need to have an expression through the power of the Holy Spirit in my Jerusalem, in my Judea, in my Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And the issue, Keith, is that there's not enough of us that have an expression of that last quadrant, ends of the earth. Right. And that's a problem. And we'll talk a little bit about those expressions and what yeah. those can look like. Yeah. Um, so where where do you go? Where, where are these unreached areas? Yeah, um, we... We are living in a time where we're sending more Bibles, um, more resources, more missionaries, both Westerners and expat or, or nationals than any time in history. We also happen to be living in an era where we have access to more data than any time in history, more research. Right. So what that means is that we know there's 195 countries in the world. And far too frequently, we do missions. I mean, just think about the last time someone said, I did a short-term mission trip to fill in the blank, you know, Guatemala, Venezuela, Honduras, Haiti. And we understand that. It's a geographic right. idea. But I tell people all the time, Keith, that Jesus didn't call us to countries. Hmm. He called us to nations. Go make disciples of all nations. And that word in the Greek means ethne or people, people group, groups, right? People right. groups. Yeah. And so um, I could be going to a country, but it's critical that I understand the spiritual condition of the nations inside of that country. Um, and so we go where there's nations that haven't heard and they're, they're really, it's, it's, it's an amazing thing, but they're concentrated mm -hmm. in a part of the world that's mainly in the Eastern hemisphere. 90% of the people who have never heard of Jesus who are unreached live in a place called the 1040 window. So it's Eastern Hemisphere, uh, the equator zero, so it's 10 degrees north of the equator to 40 degrees north. And if you were to make a box, hmm. that's the 1040 window. Yeah. And that's where we fish. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where we do our ministry because that's where the people are at who would consist of the ends of the earth. Mm -hmm. I love that idea of fishing, right? That, and that's where there's a lot of fish that are a lot of fish, underneath, right? You don't have to, you don't have to be too picky with it. Yes. Like they're just everywhere. They're everywhere. So why, why is this 1040 window so yeah. unreached? Yeah. Do you think? You know, it's it's a really uh, interesting idea and question. I, the the the, uh, the basis or the foundation, the origin point of the major religions of the world are all there including Christianity, right, of course, yeah. right? So you've got Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, all strongholds in those areas. Mm -hmm. And so when we did missions, um, when missionaries first you know, came out um, in the you know, 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, they would go by boat. And so they would go into a lot of these places and everywhere they would, they would show up, there were people who hadn't heard the gospel. And so if you look at Africa as an example, if you go to Sub-Sahara Africa, it's almost all green, which means it's all Christian. Now there's plenty of non-Christians, but the gospel is saturated Sub-Sahara Africa. And when you look at it historically, it started on the coastlines. 
So the gospel uh, was very much active and received along the coastlines. And then there was initiative for inland missions. So Sudan inland mission, Africa inland mission. When they said, hey, the guys on the coast have heard the gospel. Let's make an initiative to drive further in. So David Livingston, you know, the Congo, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going on the river, going into these inner tribes in the Congo, these exotic places. Uh, and so then there was an um, emphasis there. Well, what happened as we were going into some of these areas is that Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism were also getting entrenched into areas. And persecution uh, has become a massive issue in these places. And so as we've been doing missions, I would say in the last hundred years, we've gotten a little soft. And we continue to go for the low-hanging fruit, what we, what we think is the low-hanging fruit, the easy places. Where can I send my high school youth group? with chartreuse shirts, shirts that yeah. say, Jesus loves blank. Right. And we send them there and we check off the box that said missions and we move on. Yeah. And when you do missions like that, you're never gonna go into the Afghanistans of the world, mm -hmm. the Somalias of the world, the Libyas of the world, the, the Bangladeshs of the world, um, because you're not gonna send your high school youth group with right. chartreuse shirts right. that's on into those places, let alone almost uh, a lot of these places, Keith, you can't even get a visa to go into. Mm. So if I go, I can't even go there, then, well, I guess I'm going to go back to Haiti. And that's what happens over and over again. Wow. Hmm. So what is the process of getting into the, to these places if there's obstacles to getting yes. in there? You know. Yes. How do you tackle that? You know, and, and when we first started, it was it was such a heavy, there's there's such a genuine enthusiasm in the church in the West. And we have identified missions with the action word, go. And so when you're talking about missions, it's like, well, I've been here and I've been, even you and I are sharing right, stories, right? And, that, and that's really awesome. And God's used that. But I think what we've come to realize is that when we're looking at the 1040 window, um, you or I going is probably not going to be the best strategy. I mean, if you were to tell me today, Keith, and say, hey, the Lord's called my wife and I to go to Libya, right. I, I, I would be cal <laughs> calculating several things in my head. First, I'd be like, are, are you sure? <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Because you're going to have to learn Arabic. How's your yeah. Arabic, Keith? Yeah, not very good. Okay, not too good. No, so you need, no. I'm going to give you three years. All right, I'm going to be generous. <laughs> so you got to take three years to learn Arabic. You had to quit your job because you have to do that. So, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year or whatever. Um, and now you're going to go there and you're going to be the only only white guy around and so there's going to be curiosity it's going to take you a while to get sort of uh, culturized and meet people and get favor even to the point where they'll talk to you so Absolutely. that's another two or three years and so the, the point is that there has to be a more efficient way to do it right. and and that's through national leaders and so for us um, we have a network of 30 national networks. If you start in Senegal in the far tip of West Africa and go 9,000 miles to the east to the Philippines and Indonesia, mm -hmm. which consists of the 1040 right. window, um, we have networks that literally, from a border standpoint, connect border to border to border from mm -hmm. Senegal to the Philippines. And the only way you can get from North Africa into the Middle East and mm -hmm. over to Southeast Asia is through Israel. That's the only way. Hmm. So we look at that and we think, and, and we have uh, great relationships in Israel. Actually, the treasure, which I'm sure we'll talk about in uh, yeah. in a bit here, is our solar powered audio Bible is yeah. manufactured in Israel. Oh wow! Like all of them, our, the the engineers and the designers of it. And there's a, there's oh, wow. a a prophecy in Isaiah that says, "My word will go forth." from Zion. Mm. So every single treasure, 50,000 a year that go out, its origin is really Israel. So it's these national leaders, Keith, that really are uh, doing the the heavy lifting and mm -hmm. the field and building the relationship. They speak the language, they they can blend right into the communities. And so we resource them with our, our sort of toolbox of tools, right. the treasure, water projects, et cetera, et cetera. How do you find these national leaders? Yeah. They don't just sit there and raise their hand. Yeah, do they? it's uh, I, that probably is the most common question I ever get. And most people are frustrated with my answer. Okay, um, well, let's see. Of, <laughs> I tell them, uh, you know, I start with say, you know, birds of a common feather flock together, and that doesn't usually go anywhere. <laughs> but then I, I ask people, are you familiar with the story in Acts chapter 8? of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. So so here Philip is, and he, he, he was a waiter in Jerusalem. And as persecution hit and the church scattered, he finds himself in Samaria, 
overseeing the greatest documented revival in the New Testament as people are coming to Jesus, signs and wonders. And there, Philip, this average regular guy, is, is the point person of this revival. I tell people, if I was Philip, I would have been like, man, time to do like a building campaign. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I'm going to build a church, right? Which seems reasonable. But what happened is there's a powerful verse where it says the angel of the Lord came and spoke to Philip and said, go to the desert road. And I'm kind of thinking, man, if that was me, I'd be like, hey, I think you got the wrong dude. <laughs> like, Cause don't you see what I'm doing here? Right. But it's so inspiring, Keith, because the next word in the Bible is immediately. And Philip, without any knowledge of what the assignment was, he goes to the desert road, which by definition, there's nobody there. Well, that's where his life intersects with the mm -hmm. Ethiopian eunuch who's trying to fumble and figure out the scrolls and right. Philip leads him to Christ, gets baptized. So my answer to your question is God intersects our lives as we're in these areas pursuing his heart mm -hmm. of getting the gospel to the nations. And you meet him at conferences. You, you meet our guy in Nigeria we work with has introduced me to six people in Chad, in Senegal, in Mauritania. And if I'm working with a guy in Nigeria who is mobilizing dozens and dozens of national leaders into places where Boko Haram is at mm, yeah. and planning churches, if he says, hey, I know a guy, I'm going to be like, you listen. yes, <laughs> exactly. So it's a lot of networking. Right. So do you, I, I think I got the understanding that we don't necessarily have us going to all of these places, but you you must have some people that are mm -hmm. going to these places. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. I've, I've some amazing stories. Again, you you've been impacted by it. I can right. see it on you. Yeah. You know, I've obviously been uh, impacted greatly by by Kim, you know just having fellowship and hanging out with them, eating a meal in their living room or whatever. Board members who were uh, you know impacted on a short term mission trip. I, I think there's a real role for us in the West to go and to do things like there's some training opportunities. I think I think you know you guys send out people and you're do, doing training and play. That's a mm -hmm. very strategic role, medical missions, mm -hmm. aviation pilots, um, logistical things, and overseeing networks even. Um, all those are really important roles for the West. It's not like God's done with sending Western right. missionaries or anything. But if I can't, if you're going to tell me, hey, I'm going to go into Mauritania or Libya, and I'm thinking, <laughs> I'm scratching my head going, can you even get a visa to go there? If that's the only plan, I, maybe we need right. to reconsider this, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think... Sure. Meanwhile, we can mobilize nationals very quickly for not nearly as expensive and probably be more fruitful. So th there needs to be an assessment of um, what's the role of the Western and not have the tail wagging the dog, which uh, we can do. Sure. Uh, but we want to empower these national leaders so that they can do the work of the ministry. So let's talk a little bit about what does that empowerment look like? What are some of these tools? You know, you you quickly mentioned a couple of them. I'd love to hear more about the treasure and the water projects yeah. and those kinds of things. Just uh, feel free to just go at it with what are the tools and what are the mechanisms that we use in these areas too? Well, sure. um, I'll, I'll take you right back to the beginning when we were doing the shotgun missions and all these things. I had one of my board members and he walked into my office and he had a, this thing that looked like a book. And he threw it on my desk and it stood up like that. And he goes, I think, you know, we need to do this. And uh, I just wanted, you know, to put this on your desk and have you just check it out. And he walked out. And I wanted to like drop kick it. Like what in the world? It was a plastic thing. It looked like a book. And I, I turn around, I look at it. It's got a speaker on it. It's got like tape mm. buttons. And I'm like, what is this? It says talking Bible on it or something. And I started looking at them like, oh my gosh. what? So I just start looking. I'm like, wow, okay. You hit a button and it starts playing. It was on tapes at that time. Mm -hmm. This is nearly 20 years ago. And I started doing research, Keith. And, and here's what I learned that the most conservative data out there, UN census information, that's countries self-reporting mm -hmm. is there's 1 billion adults totally illiterate. I had no idea. That's a lot. And, and you're looking at countries like a Haiti. So Haiti is like an African, a poor African country right in our own hemisphere. Mm. And it's like, you know, 75% illiterate. And, and I, this is what struck me. Jesus called us to make disciples of all nations. It's hard to make a disciple in the absence of the word of God. And I was so convicted because I thought to myself, not one time in all the times I've been to Haiti, did I ever get on that airplane in Port-au-Prince thinking to myself, Oh my gosh, the people can't read. And that, that thought never hit me. Mm -hmm. 
And so then I started processing the implications of the challenge of making disciples. And I'm like, this audio thing is amazing. And then I, and then I learned that that's just the tip of the iceberg because the real statistic is or, orality, which is just really a newer, the last two decades of the mission world has been talking about that. Now that scoops up illiterate people, but it also grabs hold of people that prefer to learn in a non-literate way. That's an oral learner, 70% of the world. So now you're like, oh my gosh, we went from one billion to two thirds of the mm. world's population. And so I go running back into this board member's you know, office. And I'm like, and I tell him all these things he's learning and he looks at me and he goes, well, that's why I gave it to you. you know, yeah, I was funny. like, you know, that was a trick. So mm. we have been distributing over 300,000. Uh, we're close to 350,000 treasures to date now. Audio Bibles, uh, the ones we have now are not the tape player, but they've they have uh, you know every year we get new technology and the guys in Israel are brilliant and we got this little guy that maybe the size of a cell phone that has a solar panel built into it um, and uh, we have it available in over five thousand languages and we send these out to these networks and people just absorb the word of God when they get a treasure they'll listen for hours at a time so that that's really our main tool. Right. Um, we also, yeah. Does everybody get a treasure or uh, do they share it? Do multiple people listen to it? How does that Yeah, the, how does the that beautiful work? thing about these oral cultures, Keith, is that they, they do community so well. You know, you, you, we are just an individualistic society here in the West, right? I mean, we go home, open our garage door, drive in, shut it behind us, Absolutely. and right? Fighting for to do small groups and community well. Right. That's not the case in these oral cultures, Hindu, Buddhist, Muslim, it doesn't matter. They, they do things together so well. And so when you put a treasure in that environment, um, it's natural. You'll have 12 people, one treasure, you turn it on, boom, you got 12 sets of ears listening to it. And so we've trained our national leaders to set up a listening group model. And so they'll average about 12 because we get asked, you know, how many people are listening in a year? And so basically we had a simple model that our leaders are are trained to set up a new listening group every month. So once a month, a single treasure facilitates one group in January, and then in February, a new group. Now, that, they're listening to it all the time, but they're sharing mm -hmm. it. And then March, April, May. So at the end of the year, you've had 12 listening groups set up, all facilitating one treasure with 12 people, 144 people. Right. One treasure. Yeah. And we, I got a story from one time out of Chad where – uh, my, my brother, uh, our national partner there, he sends me a photo and it's, it would be kind of like similar to you got the mic and he had, he had a treasure sitting down with a mic pointing at it. And he said, brother, this is at the largest Muslim radio station in N'Djamena, Chad. And they were looking for content. And I, I showed up with my treasure and I said, well, I've got this. And they said, will you bring that on every Thursday and we'll let you play it for three hours. Wow. He said, there's a million people listening to this treasure so that kind of skewed our numbers but we uh we, the point is that how the holy spirit leads them to share is is so remarkable to us and many times we get the testimony back your god speaks my language and that just so touches your heart you know when you're thinking of the abundance of access we have mm -hmm. and these guys are hearing it for the first time that is amazing you said you've got a lot of stories and that's a pretty good story to say about a million people are listening to one Do you have any story that really like just hits you yeah in the heart or that just the, how much time, how much time do we here? have how much hey, time we've got as much time as you need <laughs> so we've uh, i just think inspiration is oh, great and i think that that can yeah, stir action absolutely yeah. you know uh i think i always think of a, a gal named sela who uh, lives in india uh, india has the highest concentration of unreached of anywhere in the world uh, into the India and Nepal corridor, so we, so we do a lot of fishing there, a lot a lot I of mean, treasures. The population density is just it's crazy, yeah. Right? I mean, one state for example is called Bihar. So Bihar is a state up in the northeast part of India, 110 million people in, in one state. state, just like you know California, Michigan, Iowa, a state of India, 110 million people, statistically 85 percent Hindu, and 15 percent Muslim. And the neighboring state. Wait, that means zero Christian. <laughs> zero percent Christian. <laughs> Got to do the math there real quick. It's a quick. graveyard of missions. And we distribute. Now, we know that there's believers in there. Sure. There's there's many believers. Right. Many churches have been planted. But uh, demographically, mm -hmm. that's in the right. census information. That's what they say. Right. So in Bihar, a precious woman named Selah had been sick and ill. And if you're in the village area of India, in rural area, and you're sick, you go to the witch doctor. 
Mm. And so she sought the witch doctor, and of course, no recovery, no you know, you know um, comfort or anything like that. Goes to the next witch doctor, next witch. She went to the yellow pages of, of witch mm. doctors, couldn't find any relief at all. Just so happened that one of our teams, our national teams, had been going through this area and sharing the gospel. And so they had shared the gospel in this area. Selah heard the gospel for the first time in her life and received Jesus. God supernaturally healed her. They gave her a treasure and she listened to it. They said for two days, she didn't stop listening to it. She just mm. absorbed the word of God. God healed her. So she had this amazing testimony because everybody knew when they looked at Selah, that's the woman who's right. sick. And she'd been going to the witch doctors and then all of a sudden she got healed by Jesus. Right. And so um, when they told me about her, they said, we want to introduce you to her because she has these disciples and um, she loves the treasure. And this this was now several months that, that she had been listening to the word of God. And they said, but brother, recently her treasure broke. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we got to get her another one. They're telling me this amazing story. And I'm like, you know, a cow stepped on it or something, right. you know. And uh, they, they, they didn't have the same sense of urgency I did to get right. her another treasure. And I kept pressing them because they were wanting to do other things and stuff. I'm like, we got to get to Selah. We got to get Selah to get her. And they finally looked at me and they said, brother, don't worry about it. She's memorized half of it. I was like, oh my gosh. Well, we we went to meet her and I, w and I saw about 20 people coming along beside her. I mean, we're sitting on a road and through these, you know, rice fields and there's these little trails in between. And I see her walking, this precious little lady with one of our leaders and these 20 people walking behind her. And I just start weeping. I'm sick of, she's not even known Jesus at this point for not less than two years. And she, you know, has 20 disciples. And they know, they go, oh, no, 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 brother. She has over 200. These are just the ones that were available right now. So there's Selah is God supernaturally healed her. She's got 200 disciples and then memorized half of the word of God. <laughs> that is amazing. And so there's people like that, Keith, that when the word hits them that that truth in isaiah that we're all familiar with in isaiah 55 where it says god's word will not return void and you see that in these places and it so inspires you i'll tell you one more story oh please do. um we one of our strategies is we'll show the jesus film right. and the jesus film is a great introduction uh to oral cultures they're seeing I'm po most powerful evangelism tool in our lifetimes right where billions of people have been exposed to the gospel so our strategy is when we'll show the jesus film um we won't do an altar call and say who wants to receive jesus but what we'll do is we'll say who wants to learn more mm -hmm. about jesus and um so you get all these hands and th those become the formations of listening groups so we were showing the Jesus film. I wasn't there. Our national leaders in, in inner Congo. Now, Congo is largely reached, but there's a, the largest unreached people group in Congo. And one of the last remaining are the pygmies. Hmm. So there's these little people and they, they are deep in the forest. They're persecuted and enslaved by the, the, the Bantu people. And so they just try and stay to themselves. Uh, they've been uh, re refused to kind of get, uh, you know, connected with culture and so we live very primitively still. So we go out there and we're, we're sharing the Jesus film. To these people, a wheelbarrow is like modern technology. Wow, wow. I mean, they just don't have anything. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, they're showing the Jesus film and pop, it, it comes up and, and the people are looking at that like those are real people right. on the How screen, right? <laughs> right? Like where they come from? And they're fierce warriors too. I tell people that the pygmies are like the combination of Tarzan and MacGyver. So, so if you get lost somewhere, you want to pig me with you. Yeah. You can fix anything. So here they are watching it, and they're fierce warriors. And so this one guy, the fiercest of all the warriors, he's standing there in the back watching this suspiciously and trying to figure this out, you know, looking at these people he thinks is real. And Luke, the book of Luke, it, it unfolds, and he's watching it, you know, okay, life of Jesus. And all of a sudden, these guys start being mean to Jesus. He's going, and that guy didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. Those guys are being, those guys are beating Jesus, crown of thorns, but nails on the cross. He got so furious as this kept going on, he finally reached in his back little pocket, grabbed his bow and arrow, and fires it at the screen to take out one of the Roman soldiers, right? So he nails the screen. Oh. The whole thing comes crashing down, and he's kind of like, like, where'd they go? Oh, wow. <laughs> Our guy there. He looks at him, he's like, my friend, my friend, it's, it's make-believe, that, that wasn't real. 
but the story's true. Wow. And he leads this pygmy guy to Christ right there. Keith, since that time, this guy's been a part. We, we just, as you can imagine, just gave him a dump truck load yep. of treasures. And he's been a part of planting over 20 churches. Now, he goes into these villages, right? Because he's pygmy. He's had an encounter with Jesus. And the people see him coming, fierce warrior. Oh, and they like right. <laughs> take for yeah. cover. Like, here he comes. And he's like, no, 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 no. And they're there. See him. And his testimony is just amazing. Kind of reminds me of Paul. You know? Exactly. Like, he couldn't have had a change. Exactly. Brother, right? That's an amazing story. So those are the kind of things, brother, that are going on around the world into these places that, that are difficult. They're hard to get to. They take, uh, it's not low hanging fruit, right? But I think as the, as the church, we, we just need to ask ourselves that question um, as, as individuals, at the body of Christ, as whatever, whatever representation we are, what is our expression of and the ends of the earth? Because just not enough of us have that. And it really, I tell people all the time, hey, it starts with prayer, mm -hmm. right? I mean, before Jesus said go, he said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers. Well, if I don't understand the harvest field, i.e. nations, it's hard for me to pray eloquently right. or with the right knowledge. I'm praying for Kenya, Kenya, Kenya. Well, Kenya has more percentage Christians than any country in the world. So let's pray for the Dashanak or the Turkana or the Somali, which are nations inside of Kenya. But if we don't know that information, then, then you know, it's hard to pray to, to send laborers mm -hmm. into there if we don't even know about it. So I encourage people to pray, but educate yourself about these places um, so that you're praying with, with, with the you know, knowledge. Was my prayer um, that people that are hearing this are getting a little bit inspired yeah. about um, what World Mission is doing and and the impact it's having on, on this world. So what can the listener, the, the viewer, me, yeah. what can we what can we do? I know yeah. you've started yeah. down that road and yeah. feel free to repeat pray. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what yeah. what can we do? How can we partner with world mission what can well we do? I, I i truly believe this with all my heart if every follower of jesus right now the statistics are it's pretty it's pretty not to discourage us but the truth is that nearly 99 percent of us don't have any expression of the ends of the earth now we're doing missions and we're checking the box and we're going to the hades and guatemalas of the world but we don't have an expression of the ends of the earth so my my, my deep conviction is that if every follower of jesus has an expression through prayer, through giving, through going, through whatever, um, to the ends of the earth, then we are the generation that fulfills the Great Commission. But right now, the numbers are pretty staggering. That doesn't mean we can't turn the tide. But every day, Keith, 65,000 people. It's it's approximately, I, I give people, this is a very powerful, you want, a, you want a powerful visual to think about unreached. Just tap tap your, your chest like this. Every time your heart beats, somebody passes into eternity who never had access to the gospel. Mm. No missionary, no Bible, no church, no pastor, no anything. 65,000 people every single day. Kind of makes so, me nauseous. Isn't it? I mean, it's just, it just, and so I think when I read that book and I, you, we need to, before we can say, what's my expression, we need to steward the Great Commission. In other words, take ownership of it. Until that happens, it's hard for me to say, I want to have an expression of Duns of the Earth. So it really starts there, which is the, the prayer element. And easy on-ramps, I mean, for us after prayer, when we send a treasure, it takes it forty, about 40 to 50 bucks for me to send one of these solar-powered audio Bibles to Libya, to Mauritania, you know, to Pakistan, to Afghan refugees, all scattered over, over, over Pakistan. Uh, into Somalia, so we're 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 sending them because we built networks. We we've sort of built the framework to get the units in. Um, so just from a financially standpoint, that's that's really what we need. I mean, I could send a million treasures out tomorrow, and it's just like, Lord, this is our vision. We believe we're carrying out you know your last words, uh, a priority. But we just need you know really prayer. We need resources uh, so we can do water projects. I'll, I'll tell you just one more quick story. Uh, as it relates to strategic humanitarian projects. We do medical, we do disaster relief, and water. And the reason we do that is because without exception, one of those humanitarian tools creates access into a community. And clean water is massive. So in northern Nigeria, where Boko Haram's at all over the place, um, our guys went into a village 
And the village chief is everyone, you know, he's everything, the judge, the jury, the executioner, right? The chief is everything. And he saw these guys coming with their Bible and he said, you're not welcome. And if you try and come back, proselytize, tell people about Christianity, we'll kill you. And he wasn't kidding. And so off they went. And uh, as they were talking and strategizing, they said, hey, that village there is in dire need of water. They're walking the women. And it's normally the women. <laughs> Guys are so lazy. Right. But it's normally the women, right, who are going to get the water in the watering hole. And they were walking three miles one way just to get bacteria filled water. But that's the best they have, right? So this same missionary came back and was able to say, hey, no Bible, no Bible. Friend, um, we know you have a water problem here. We're interested in, in providing a water well, a borehole. And the chief was like, you know, taken back. Like, well, why would you do that? Because we love you guys. Hmm. We just care about you. We're not, we're not trying to preach or do anything. And that chief looked at him and he thought, yeah, that would be, a, that would be wonderful. That would be a blessing. So he gave them and we, we were able to resource that. Built, drilled that well, about $8,000. And that chief, when at the dedication of the well, he looked at these the same national partners he threatened to kill. And he said, hey, that 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 thing that you had, he was talking about a treasure that, that you wanted to show. Can I get one of those for every one of my homes here? Every person who lives in this village, can we get one? Yeah, well, it was just because an act of love changed the whole soil that was a hard heart to very fertile ground. And now there's a church in that community. And so, I mean, it's things like that that we need to think strategically and say, God, how can I? A, we need to be intentional to go mm -hmm. there. Right. Um, but then once we get there, we need to, you know, be sensitive to the spirit about what what is a key that unlocks this heart. Mm -hmm. And as the Holy Spirit reveals that, we need to be prepared to respond, whether it's, you know, medical or food or blankets or relief. We've seen it over and over and over again um, where some kind of a strategic humanitarian pro project opens up the door to the gospel and revival comes in there because the hard heart changed. Mm. Well, we've set it up here on our website, a uh, way to give financially mm. um, on our website. So anyone who's listening or, awesome. or watching, they can go to shoreline.church and Beautiful. go to the give and select world mission. It's labeled world mission treasures. Um, we'll uh, obviously pass those resources awesome. on how wonderful. you see fit to use it. Yeah. Uh, and then if they don't go mm. through our website, yeah. what is a very practical, tangible way for for people to get connected. Yeah, they can you. get to our website, uh, worldmission.cc, as in Christ-centered. Um, also, worldmission.help mm. is uh, our kind of ongoing humanitarian. Um, and then we've got Facebook and Instagram and all the... We also have a couple podcasts, too, that that right. we do, um, similar to what you guys are doing right. to try and share the vision that's called the World Mission Update on okay. YouTube and other the normal you know podcast uh, uh, resources. But uh, just trying to get the word out there, encourage people... Um, our website, though, worldmission.cc, is really sort of the gateway to uh, explore all those avenues. Well, I just know that great things are going to happen ah, with World Mission. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much for sharing your your vision and what you're doing with uh, with us today. And we look forward to seeing what God's going to do through you. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Privilege to be with you. All right. Whether you're listening on your podcast app or watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe if you want to hear more. Thanks for listening.